We are heading into the afternoon here at Pokegamer Connects 2019 in London and I am joined by, introduce yourself gentlemen. So Ben Atherton from Facebook. And? Alessio Ricida from Facebook Gaming as well. Fantastic. And you have described your interactions with Facebook. You are the head and the torso of... Well, okay, so... And the torso and the I'm going straight well. in with the uh, bodily uh, analogies. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's a, it's a, it is a good analogy. So uh, my team deals with publishers who are in the torso and tail of all publishers in EMEA. So we have uh, a really large number of publishers that we work with mm -hmm. and we monetize those publishers. They are almost exclusively app publishers um, and the gaming vertical is really dominant. Mm. So we work with gaming publishers from Siberia and we work with gaming publishers from Warwick. You know, we work with gaming publishers from the whole region. Mm -hmm. People often associate Facebook with games in terms of, ah, oh, we play them in the browser, or in 2017 you guys did the Facebook Messenger games, and obviously a lot of the data that Facebook has and has acquired is used for publishing networks and ad networks that's shared with people, but they don't necessarily immediately think of you guys as like people who are like lifting publishers and taking them through the journey of bringing a game to market and bringing them to the store. So in terms of making that work, what is it that Facebook does differently from a standard like you know publishing network? So. The year before last, 2017, we gave $3.2 billion to publishers. So, you know, quite a chunky figure, uh, probably not very well known. No. Um, and that's purely on the monetization side. Okay. So that's the side I deal with. Um, but in terms of what we do differently, which is kind of the, the core of your question, is we try and work with the publisher to build a sustainable business throughout the, if you like, commercial life cycle. Mm -hmm. So from UA, which, you know, I'll, I'll let you talk about in a second, all the way to um, after you've acquired the customers, how you actually you know, monetize them. We try to coach them and work with our tools and resources to make sustainable businesses for them. Because a lot of these businesses are, you know, they're SMBs. They're small and medium sized businesses. They might be a studio of at the very largest 50 people, but most of them might be in the range of, you know, five to 12 people. Um, so, you know, they do need the, the, the kind of help and the resources that we give. But I think it's logical to start at the beginning of the um, chronological journey. With the UA. With the, with UA. the UA. So, so uh, when you're trying to grab users, you're, uh, from a, I guess, a publisher perspective, if we're, if we're trying to use your, your network, you want the right kind of user, the highest value user, and, the, and the, I guess the most for the money. So how do you guys provide that? Exactly, so every publisher uh, on the other side of the coin is an advertiser. So he's a giving advertiser that wants users inside his app. And our solutions are uniquely designed to help these advertisers to get the exact players that they want. Being an hyper casual and you want just the players or highly retained players or just affordable CPIs, or on the other side of the spectrum, if you're a like strategy game or a mid or in the mid-core market, then you will need high value players or just payers. And then the solutions we have, the optimization uh, technology that our solution have, help the, uh, these advertisers to get exactly the players that they need. And then once you've acquired those players, it kind of pulls over to your to, side. To Ben's team, exactly. And then you guys have to then like target the right kind of ads or push the right kind of thing in their faces? Yeah, there's, there's sort of two, oh, oh yeah, I wouldn't say push the right kind of thing in their faces. Slightly bad phrasing <laughs> on my part. Present in a nice non-threatening way, as yeah. I say. So if you think, yeah, if you take the UX question first, I, I think a lot of gaming publishers are really sophisticated mm. in terms of how they knit advertising into the UX. I think it's because they know full well that if the advertiser rejects the experience, sorry, if the user rejects the experience, there's, there's no sustainable future for their game from a commercial point of view. What's interesting about the gaming industry is that a large majority of people fully accept the value exchange. So I think from our research, 73% of all gamers accept um, that advertising is part of it. You know, it's a value exchange. You know, I'm getting a free game, I'm getting some value out of that, yeah. and in return, somebody's got to pay for it, right? There's it's a very vocal minority that pushes back, and we get a lot of it on Pocket Gamer, the consumer site, people are complaining about IAPs, but the bottom line is, the reason they're there is because it works, and it generates a massive amount of, in of income because people accept it. So it's this kind of, there are people complaining on the fringe, but there's the silent majority who are like, no, we get we get that it's give and take. Yeah, and you know, it, it, it's fully fair that people complain. That's, you know, if they don't like it, they don't have to play the game. It's entirely up to them, you know, no one's forcing them to do that. Mm. But it, it's the internet as we see it today, right? I and mean, we won't get into that argument right now. That's but a different thing, yeah. It's a broader, you know, that's what's happening in the world. Yeah. Like, you know, people want to access things for free mm -hmm. is a major trend, but that's a different trend. Um, but to the next part of the chronological journey, 
you know, I've invested some money in UA with Facebook. Mm -hmm. I've grown my users from maybe the first few thousand to the first few tens of thousands or the first few hundreds of thousands. And now I need to make sure that actually I can pay my developers and I have a future for my business. Um, and then I, I've, I've already started thinking about the game flow. I've already started thinking what type of format I'm going to have where in my game. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're a casual game, you might decide, you know, within the first few sessions, you're going to have an interstitial or rewarded video. Yeah. But if you're a, a, um, a mid-core game, um, or even a hardcore game, you might decide that's not going to happen until, until many, many, many levels further. And that's a t it's a very different business model because you've invested a lot in your capex and opex and your startup costs in order to probably break even after 18, 24, 36 months. Mm. Whereas in hyper casual, you're actually thinking of breaking even on day one. Because okay, the loop is that much smaller yeah, and more yeah. media. Yeah, so that's why advertising is so important. Mm. Um, and, and the user knows that. So the critical formats are obviously interstitials and rewarded video. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that it's not so much these days that people design a game and then add advertising in that sector. I think what they do is they think, I need to satisfy both you know, how I make my money plus my user. The user understands and accepts that value exchange. So if I'm playing a casual game from a voodoo or whoever it might be, I know I'm going to get an interstitial ad. If you're as bad a gamer as me, you know, you're going to fail really quickly. Right, yeah. and then you're going to see your first interstitial probably. Sure. And then maybe later if I get a wee bit better and I want to get another life, uh, you may see your first rewarded video. Well, it's much more established now, and I think near the beginning you start to see people who decided like halfway through development, oh, actually, we're not going to be premium, we're going to be free to play. And it was always glaringly obvious, and it didn't really work. It, it felt like something that the games that worked had it built in right from the beginning. Yeah, it's a very interesting trend. We've seen a lot. We've had a lot of our publishers come to us, and we're going to talk about this on the panel at 2.30 with one of our publishers, um, Super Solid. Oh, yeah. They're an IAP publisher. They've built a simulation game um, in the restaurant space. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are looking at how they monetize users. But those users are way more mature than your hypercatural user. They, they might have been playing the game for many, many tens of hours or hundreds of hours. So they're very careful about finding the right cohorts and segments. Mm. So what a lot of publishers are doing now are going, well, you know, if I have you know, segment X over here, they'll, they'll do anything and they'll watch anything and they're just going to keep coming back. Segment Y over here, never going to watch anything from an advertising point of view. Mm. And they might churn really quickly. I need to think, and then the silent majority in the middle, yeah. I need to think how I serve all those cohorts in terms of their enjoyment of the game. From a commercial point of view, I want you know, lifetime customer value, I want low churn, I want high use you know, um, session rates, but at the same time, um, that's, those are all user metrics, but at the same time I need to make money. Mm. So they're going through this balance of you know, how do I do that, how do I do that in a way that works for the gamer. Well, you talked about sustaining the thing. If you're talk, dealing with publishers and trying to ensure that they have a business model that will not only work for the short term but go for the long term, what are the things that you're anticipating in the future? Because the, in terms of the way that things are marketed, we went from like banner ads to, to targeted video became the next thing. Influencer marketing is now the big thing. How do you future proof? What's the next thing or what are you guys working on at the moment? So definitely we see playable ads being absolutely the killer this year. Okay. So the way advertising is being more entertaining and more interactive towards users. So the users are looking for ways to interact with the game when they're seeing an interstitial, when they're seeing a rewarded video, and this is where we see the most value. Uh, but I also see, for example, Fortnite, all, those, all these big uh, game uh, game changers that are coming to the to the spectrum are actually enlarging the kind of pool of audience. Uh, uh, their gamers are becoming more diversified, and so as gamers diversify themselves, uh, you need to look for different kind of specific gamers, and new business model will come up, and we will help these advertisers to to look for those specific gamers.